Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Pocket Theology. Today, Jason and I are going to be discussing the prayer of Jabez. We're also going to dissect what prosperity gospel looks like, and we're going to talk about how we can increase the territory of God's kingdom. We'll also mention how we got the awesome opportunity to partner with Compassion International this past weekend and a little bit more about what that looked like. So if that sounds interesting or inspiring to you at all, we're so glad you're here. So a Holy Week, Holy Week is probably my favorite week of the year. I completely agree with you for the sense of everything that it is. It's just also like church Super Bowl, so it's really busy. It's busy, and it's there's also, okay, so here's why I like Holy Week, not just from a church perspective. I like what the intention of Holy Week is. Oh, yeah, the preparation aspect? No, all the different things. So like uh, Holy Week is in preparation of the resurrection, right? Yeah. But we have our Monday, Thursday service. We have Good Friday. Saturday is supposed to be a day of silence or there's nothing going on. But we also were doing a, a prayer and worship night on Monday night. Mm -hmm. Palm Sunday kicks it off. And I'm super excited. Now we're, we'll be watching this post Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, we've partnered with Compassion International. Yeah. And um, so we've been doing this, we've been doing a whole series on prayer and called prayer, pray it forward. And we've mm -hmm. been looking at biblical prayers, different prayers throughout the Bible. And there are tons of different prayers, right? And, uh, and actually this is part of our conversation. So we had sermon read through and the prayer for the last Sunday of Lent leading into Holy Week, we talked about the prayer of Jabez, mm -hmm. right? Are you familiar with the prayer of Jabez? I am not. I mean, apart from what we've just, we talked about a sermon read through, which you didn't, weren't there for I most missed. of it. That's okay. That's okay. Uh. No judgment, no judgment. All the judgment. All the all the judgments are there. Uh, so I'm going to set the scene in 2000, April of 2000, so almost 24 years to the day. Almost 24 years. Uh, man, 2000. What a great year to be born. Uh, shut your face. It was <laughs> 25, man. It was 25. Um, a very popular book came out, and that uh, was from a guy named Bruce Wilkerson. Okay. And uh, he wrote a book. It was a little small book, like, I mean, maybe maybe 60 pages, and it's kind of like this big. It's not even a big book. It's sure. a very tiny book. And it, it kind of took every... I mean, it's a best-selling book, right? What's the title? Prayer of Jabez. Prayer, Prayer of Jabez. And it's based on uh, just two verses. The whole entire book is uh, based on two verses from the book of First Chronicles. Okay, now, here's a little fun, just because I'm a Bible nerd and I like to share this stuff. Uh so uh, in the history of Israel, you have, you have different kinds of genres in the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Well, part of there are historical narratives about the kingdom of Israel. And the historical, you have uh, First and Second Samuel, which is the rise of King Saul, then King David, and then you see Solomon, First and Second Kings, which is about the kings that come afterwards. And what's interesting is First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, they show the dark side of Israel's, a very human side. So there's a lot of brokenness. It's in those that it talks about David's failure yeah. with Bathsheba and all the bad things. Chronicles is interesting. Chronicles is a retelling of the the kingdom of Israel and the kings, but it leaves out all the bad stuff. Sure. So it's like a rose tinted glasses version. That's of right. The story. It's it's meant to be. It only highlights the good things that took place. And, and does that come before, or because I don't know my Bible books where they line up, does that come before or after all those stories are already told? Well, okay. So now this is interesting. And then this is going to get into our overall conversation. Uh, all right. So check this out. Um, our canon, which mm -hmm. is the collection of books that we have. Now, it's important to remember the Bible is not a book, it's a collection. The, the word Bible. Is it's a library yep. is a better understanding, right? So we have a collection of Old Testament books, New Testament books. Yep. There's a Hebrew Bible or canon, mm -hmm. and the Hebrew Bible arranges their books differently. Yep. And they arrange them towards the Tanakh. Okay. Yep. So you have the Torah, first five books of the Bible, Nevim and, and the Ketuvim, right? And that's the Torah, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Yep. Um, they we put. And the way we do ours, we do first, second Samuel, first, second Kings, first, and second Chronicles. Okay. And what it makes it seem like is that's the order. But in the Hebrew Bible, Chronicles comes way after, and it's actually, if I, and I have to go back and look at the Hebrew Bible, um, but theirs is like after they've done all the history, now it's they're coming back and they're demonstrating, they're talking about Chronicles. 
Oh, we okay. put them as is that they all belong together. Okay, sure. And they viewed it differently. So that's kind of a hard question to answer. The right. way, the well, way in our New Testament framework as a Western mentality, we bunch them together based upon genre. They're bunched together, but it still happens. Chronicles is still after. Yes, it's right? a, that's why it's it's the highlights, but it's all the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right? I was thinking if if one of them was it was before. It's like, oh, here's all the good. No, nah, here's the reality. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was, it was all like, no. This is, this is uh, the posturing. Like, look at all the good things it, that are happening. It's almost in like, Israel. hey, if we, if you were to take away anything from this, here's the good stuff. Uh, no, not, well, not that it's not that there isn't anything to valuable to be had in the other parts, but it's like, hey, remember this bit. It's even more than that. Sure. It's actually, I think, it's a form of rhetoric. Okay. In which they're they're just kind of. Glossing over the bad stuff. Okay, <laughs> sure. Like we don't really. Yeah, need... I mean, at the end of my life, I hope someone does that too. You know, right? Yeah, I mean, kind of like that's actually yeah. might be an interesting way to think about it. Is yeah. think of like a funeral. Like, yeah, I've done I've done funerals for people that when everybody outside of the funeral they talk about, I'm like, man, I couldn't stand this person, and yet then people get up there and talk about how wonderful they were and oh wow, how charitable they were, yeah, and... the dichotomy there, and, right? And it's like because and it's so it's kind of very similar. Sure. It's that's why it's kind of a, a rhetoric of sure. Uh, it is it's well, almost propaganda ish. Isn't, well, isn't history kind of like that? Always, though? yeah, yeah. And that's that's part of the reason why I think it's important that it's in the Bible. Yeah. Is it's not it's not lying. No, it's glossing over. Which sure. what is human nature? We tend to not talk about our failures. Yeah. And here, whereas First Second Samuel, First Second Kings, clearly shows the failures of Israel's leaders. Yeah. Including the great King David, whereas Chronicles does not. Okay, so it's interesting. Is in Chronicles, like the first twelve chapters, are all about they're all genealogies, and there's some some stories intermittent in there, uh, and in twelve it finally leads up to the genealogy of. Uh, David had a, a group of mighty men who were called the mighty men of David or the warriors of David, right? And it ends with their genealogy. MMOD. Yeah, there we go. Yo. Yo. Uh, all right, so check this out. This is in Chronicles 4, 1 Chronicles 4, or 1 Are Chronicles. Are these the two verses? Yep. Okay. 1 Chronicles 4, and uh, I'm actually going to read a little beforehand, because here's the danger. When we read the prayer of Jabez, and when he read his book— he didn't include the context of it. He only took these two verses. Yeah. And what, what Wilkerson ultimately said was this, and he even has an excerpt, and, and I want to be careful, and I said this in, in my message as well. I don't know his heart. I know he loves Jesus. Um, I believe God has used him to do good things for his kingdom, and, and I think his heart is in a good place, right? And he himself has said that he does not buy into the prosperity gospel. But he wrote a book in, in a little excerpt he put in there that this is a prayer that if you pray it, it is guaranteed God will do these things for you. Uh, wow. Like he guarantees it. Like yeah. God will, in fact, do this. If you pray this 30 days, God will do this, right? Sure. And and it's interesting because the way you read it, you almost think like, oh, this must be like the story of Jabez. And here's, no, it's two little lines, an excerpt in the midst of a rather long family tree. This is what it says. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, starting with 4, I'm not going to read 1 through 12, chapters 1 through 12. I'm going to start with chapter 1, or chapter 4, verse 1, and then read to Jabez, okay? The sons of Judah, now that may not, names may sound familiar, uh, the tribe of Judah, mm -hmm. were Perez, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, and Shobal, and Reiah, the son of Shobal, begot Jahath, and Jahath begot the Ahumai and Lahad. There were the families of the Zorathites. These were the sons of the father of Atam, Jezreel, Ishman, Idbash. And the name of their sister was Hazalapani. And Apanoel was the father of Gedor. And Ezer was the father of Husha. These were the sons of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrath. Ephrathah, the father of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, key that? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're like, now, first of all, am I saying these right? I have no clue. One of my professors once said, if you're not sure how to pronounce something in the Hebrew or when it's there, just say it like say, you know it. And then as confidently as you, confidently can, as you can, right? No but just can... say it nonetheless. Yep. And Ashur, the father of Tekoa, had two wives, Hala and Na'ara, and Na'ara bore him Ahuzam, Hefer, Tamini, Hara, Shatari. These were the sons of Nahara. The sons of Hela were Zareth, Zohar, and Ethnon, and Koz begat Anab, Zobaba, and the families of Araharal, the son of Haram. Okay, now this is everything before then. Now it says this. Now it, Jabez... For just a second, man. For a while there, you had a really good rhythm. Didn't like, I? Hana, hara, hara. Well, okay, <laughs> interestingly, Hebrew, Aramaic actually has... Yeah, I know. They're very a, rhythmic languages, yeah, yes. Right? And then all of a sudden it says, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. 
Okay. This is weird. Like, there's all these lists, so and so, so and so. And now, Jabez, there's no transition. Literally saving the best for last. No, there's still more, way there's more still after this. More? Way oh. more after this. Oh. Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez. Yep. Saying, because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, this is the prayer. Here's the two lines. Okay. Two are two verses that that he wrote an entire book on and said, if you pray this prayer, God's going to do these things for you. He guaranteed it. Okay. Now, let's be clear. Nowhere in the Bible does it say if you pray a prayer. I think the only time actually where it might do that is in forgiveness. Sure. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. Sure. There's no other place where it says this. Nowhere does it say this. Now, you're supposed to pray this prayer so you'll be blessed. Okay. Right. So Jabez, whose name means born in pain. Okay. Jabez called on the God of Israel, which is Yahweh, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. He wrote an entire book on those two verses. Now, here's the, the thing that happened. I remember reading this book, and part of it was, if, if you pray, God, enlarge my territory. I'm calling on you. Bless me. Enlarge my territory. God's going to make your business bigger. He's going to make your church bigger. Mm. And, 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 and then it was, uh, you know, and you, you, God, his hand will be with you, that you will keep, keep you from evil, and that you'll not cause pain. Now, here's the thing. Um, again, I, I don't like speaking ill, and I talked about this on Sunday. I, I don't, I don't want to say, I, I try not to criticize other pastors and their works, but what this ultimately taught a generation, mm -hmm. and I know this because I was one of the ones who believed it, was we began to look at prayer as more a new age practice than the actual gift that prayer is. Sure. Right? So let's, uh, let's think about this for a second. Right now, it's very popular in our culture, and this isn't new. Uh, there was a book that Oprah Winfrey uh, promoted for years called The Secret. Yep. Right? And The Secret was all about, you know, the, the secret to get the things that you want in life. And yep. you can get in tune with the universe. And if you learn the secret, your business will prosper, right? Well, now we're just throwing on the tagline of, well, now just say it to God. Sure. And now in the language that's popular is manifesting. Manifesting, yep. Right? And and I, I think it's dangerous because... In one sense, we have a God who wants to bless us. Mm -hmm. And I do think we can call on God's blessings, and I mm -hmm. think it's appropriate to pray a prayer that we see. I think most things in Scripture we can pray the heart of. Mm -hmm. You look like you want to say something. Well, yeah, because I kind of got, I, I kind of, like, as I was listening to it and having a, this is the problem that the listeners don't have that I do, is that I did get to hear a little bit more about the context of where you're going with this, and you talked a little bit about prosperity gospel, and you just said it now, where it was like sometimes people, when they say, I'm praying for a territory, enlarge my business, enlarge my yep. pro my profits and things like that. And I was thinking to myself, well, what if you just kind of changed your heart posture about it a little bit, where instead of like, hey, God, enlarge my territory, it was more so like, God, enlarge my influence so that you can use me ah, to help okay. people. Yep, and so there's the primary difference, okay? So one, uh, I don't think you can actually pray a prayer and then God's going to respond simply because you prayed it. Right. Right. You could say, Lord, I want to have more influence in my, in, in my industry. Yeah. So that I can, I can bring more glory to you. Oh, okay. I, I think that's appropriate. I, you're, you're saying there's not a problem with the prayer. You're saying it's a problem with the, that it was presented like God's going to give you. Yes. And as, as if the God's goal is that he wants you to, he wants to enlarge sure. your territory. Cause I was trying to dissect the prayer itself where I was like, well, God don't lead me away from evil. I was like, I pray that all the time. No, no, no. And, and no. And in fact, and that's evil. part of the reason when in missing sermon read through, we actually, that's what we talked about oh, on okay. Sunday was a large part of this is no, through the lens of Jesus, this is actually a very powerful prayer. Sometimes people compliment us on the podcast and they're like, Jaden, you have really good insights. You must do a lot of studying. Sometimes I'm learning right alongside with you, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> the problem with prosperity gospel yeah. is it is manifestation gospel, not a kingdom gospel. Yeah, okay, I see. Whereas if the goal that God has for you is it's all about more for you. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to have a bigger business. God wants, God wants this for you because... God wants to prosper you, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And here's the danger, is that I do believe God wants us to be prosperous, 
but who defines prosperous? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God does. Yeah. And the problem with prosperity gospel is that we are the ones who think we define blessing. We define blessing the prosperity of what means more money. Mm -hmm. In this case, enlarge my territory. Yeah. And now, interestingly, and I didn't, I, I don't think I get into this on Sunday. I, I haven't preached it yet, so I don't know, but I don't think I'm going to. Um, there were three ways that you viewed somebody as having a successful life. Mm -hmm. Land, yep. offspring, blessing. Right. Those three things. If you have a lot of land, if you have a lot of kids, you're blessed. Mm -hmm. So he's actually saying, God, here's the evidence that I'm blessed, is that I, I need you to enlarge my territory. Now, here's an interesting side part to this. In going through the family line, the reason why these, these names are so important, this is a genealogy, if you just go back a little bit, okay, so just listen to the head, headings of First Chronicles, okay? And I'm just going to do the headings. I'm not even going to read the text. I'm just going to read that. The family of Adam, Seth to Abraham. The family of Keturah. The family of Isaac. The family of Sire. The, the kings of Edom. The family of Israel. From Judah to David. Each of these are, these are the family lines, the genealogies. This is chapter 2, the family of Hezron. The family of Jeharmiel. Um, then we get into... Continuing, then it's the family of Caleb. Then chapter three, the family of David. This is the family lines, right? Mm -hmm. These are big name players. Yeah. These are people who had success, who had lots of land, lots of territory, yep. lots of sheep. Lots of offspring. Lots of wives sometimes. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> the family of Solomon, the family of Jeconiah, the family of Judah. And in the middle of the family of Judah in verses nine through 10 is Jabez. Jabez. And Jabez, who's born in pain, doesn't have, he doesn't have a blessed life. In fact, he seems to have a, he was born in hardship. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I feel like that's what made him so special, maybe for the, for the, his mother that said that he was her favorite, is because he, she, he was well, born in the valley. No, he wasn't her favorite. He was God's favorite. God's favorite. God's uh, favorite. Oh, okay. God, he was favored by God. Ah. Because he was born in the valley. Gotcha. Right? And, and interestingly... The reason why he's praying enlarge my territory, all these other people might have been capable of doing it because they had a leg up. Uh, I had somebody once say, uh, there's nothing worse than somebody who's born on third base and acts like they hit a triple. Oh, sure. Yeah. Or doesn't do anything with it. Stays or, on third. Or they think that because they got out, because they made it home, look what they did, right? Sure, yeah. Who's on Being, third? No, who's on first? Ah. I caught it. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> well played, sir. Thank you. Um. Part of what's interesting about this is that it's possible yeah. that when Jabez is praying this, all these other people, their lives were, I mean, all childbirth is painful. Yeah. There's some degree of pain with childbirth, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what she's, what is being said here is he was born in a time where maybe there wasn't prosperity in the family or there was no. hardship in the family. Or there was well, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's a, it's a good thought. Uh, there's something attributed to his birth. Mm-hmm. That makes his name, the naming of him, so important. And it could be that his birth was more painful. Okay. Some scholars believe that he might have been born with a disability or deformity mm. so that he couldn't be, he couldn't have lots of wives, he couldn't have land. Does his mom play a role later in the picture? So maybe she died? This is all we know. Maybe, did she maybe pass away? Have, and that was... Doesn't say. Sure. Literally, all we know is that he's born of pain. Sure. His name literally means pain. Uh. So you like you know you stop being a Jabez in my butt right stop being a, <laughs> that's literally that's literally what that's I'm saying that from now on for, stop being a Jabez stop, you you're being such, such a Jabez, Jabez. <laughs> <laughs> but here we're seeing Jabez who instead of wallowing in his pain yeah instead of wallowing in a poor me he cries out to God mm -hmm. the God of Israel yeah which is important yeah because we've just told this whole backstory of the people of Israel all the way to the line of Adam and he's saying hey. I want to be blessed. Only you can enlarge my territory. All these other people, they enlarge their own territories. Sure. Okay. They had so there was something in them that they could do it. And yes, God blessed them, but he's saying, God, you need to be the one to do this for me because I can't do it for myself. Cool. And then he also says, and I need you to protect me and that you would keep me from evil and that I may not cause pain. So interestingly, how many times do you know people who, because of their pain, are now causing pain to other people? Oh, it happens all the time. Right? I heard a great uh, a great uh, statement, and that is, whatever you don't transform, you transmit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah. And he's saying, hey, I don't want to transmit my brokenness and my pain into the world. Yeah. 
and there, there's a profoundness to that. Oh, for sure. You're 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 praying for a, an end to your family curses. Right. Okay. Now, fast forward. Here we are as Christians. How do we pray this? Mm. Well, if we look at Jesus and what Jesus calls us to, Jesus redefined blessing. And this is the danger with prosperity gospel. And we had a big, long conversation in Sermon Read Through because part of the appeal of prosperity gospel, usually the places where prosperity gospel and churches are centered are usually in low-income areas, mm. um, often in, in uh, um, ethnic communities. Mm -hmm. And often the people who buy into prosperity gospel are people who are desperate to be blessed because they're poor or they perceive they're not blessed because of poverty. Sure. Right. And this this is why if you look at and this is one of the criticisms is you'll have pastors in prosperity churches that are driving around in very expensive cars where the average person in their church is barely scraping by. Sure. And and the danger that comes with and this is what ultimately my struggle um, with Wilkerson's book. Is that it focused that the goal that God has for you is that he wants you. He's the God who gives you more of what you think it means to be blessed. Oh, uh, yeah. And I don't, I don't think that was his heart. I really don't. Right. But that's how most people took it. I know I took it that way. Right. I mean, we can say things and people interpret them differently than what we mean all the time. And, and, the, the, and this is all, again, when it comes to prayer, I think this is the danger of, well, let me show you a prayer that if you pray, if you pray this, and he even says this in his excerpt, God will answer it. His words, word for word. Pray this prayer, God will answer it. And what that implies to the average person reading is, oh, if I pray out to God, enlarge my territory, God's going to make my territory bigger. But what does Jesus do? Jesus flips everything, and Jesus doesn't care about your territory. Uh -huh. he, kings about, he cares about taking back ground from the enemy yeah. in the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. And so to your point, when we pray this prayer of God, I want to be a person of influence so I can share the gospel. Yeah. Well, God's going to know your heart better than you do. He's going to be able to weed through. Is Jaden? Is this actually something yeah. that's going to benefit Jaden? Does Jayden? he want to make? Do you, does he want to make my name famous, or does Jaden want clout? Yeah. Or can Jaden even handle? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's fair. Because some people think that we they assume that they can handle influence. Some people assume they can handle more money, yeah. and then they get more money. And what happens with people who win the lottery? More money, more problems. That's right. <laughs> people. I, I, I wish I could remember the, the large majority of people who win the lottery regret winning it. Well, yeah, it ruins families sometimes. Families, the drug addiction. Uh, the guy who won, I think he won the largest Powerball in like the early 2000s or 90s or something like that. His family fell apart. One of his kids died from an addiction. He That's got crazy. robbed. But what do we assume blessing is? We assume blessing, according to to God, is well, that means I have to have more money. So you can pray, God, enlarge my territory, but... God in his wisdom is going to go, yeah, you can't handle that, or you really don't mean that, or if he knows you, he might bless you with more influence because he sees that you truly want to be a light in the yeah. world. And that's and that's part of our, our human lacking. I mean, we're physical creatures, and we don't have heaven vision. We don't have his yeah. sight of the whole picture. And so sometimes a lot of our prayers are physical because really that's— that's what our reality is, right? Yeah. It's 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 hard to pray. Not that you know we've talked about that everything is spiritual, but God sees it that way, and yeah. God has heaven's sight, and we don't. Well, and, and it's more than he this. That's another interesting. We get into the quality of God. Uh, heaven is a created place created by God. No, I mean heaven's sight. Like He's got the big picture. Yeah, but no, but I love that you said that because this is an interesting view of God. Heaven did not exist, and then God was created in heaven. Mm -hmm. God always existed. God created heaven. Now, why does this matter? I mean, okay. my, even just to my understanding, all heaven is, is just being with God. Well, but it's also a place. Right. On earth, eventually, when the kingdom Well, comes but there's also earth. a place that is heaven that is not with earth. So there right is a now. place. Of, it is a physical yet not physical place that exists. This is why I'm excited for the series after Easter. Yeah, we're, we're rolling right into this. That's what's Dude, happening. I am so stoked for this series. Sorry, we're totally sidetracking right now. Um, but it, uh, the reason why I, I keyed on that when you said, you know, he has heaven's sight. Yeah. No, he has God's sight. Yeah. Um, and God in his wisdom sees, he knows my heart. He yeah. knows He knows the parts of me that I don't. Yeah. And he doesn't just see with perfect vision. He sees He sees the parts, the in-between spaces. Oh, and this is what's been so beautiful. This is a, this is a part of in a book that I've recently been reading is that God also see, knows the outcome already. Yeah. Uh, they, the, this is a little off track, but this is about his 
wisdom and his knowledge yep. about this in our hearts and stuff is God describes himself as the I am, not the I was yep. or I this. Like so that so past, present, and future are all him, right? So he also knows already. And that's part of his wisdom and sight in that scenario. I too. am here, I am there, and I am yeah. there there. So right. He, so he's also already got the no man, I know. And and this is the this goes back to the problem with prosperity gospel yeah. is um, so in the 90s, 80s, 90s, prosperity gospels really took root. There was a guy, um, and I'll just say his name because he doesn't know who I am, Robert Tilton. So a very famous televangelist. And in the 90s, um, I remember watching him, and he was on one of those pay stations where you have people on, and, and he would talk about, you need to do your your vow, uh, what was it, your your vow of blessing, your your vow of a seed blessing or something like that. But he actually said, this was in one of his things that he said, <clears throat> God, uh, if you want a blessing from the Lord, he doesn't want your $10. He doesn't even want your $100. Yeah. He wants a minimum $1,000 vow of blessing, a seed that if you send to my ministry, I'm going to pray over it, and God's going to give it back to you tenfold. And he then said, and if you need to take out credit cards, if you need to take a loan out on your house, get me that get me that $1,000 vow, that seed of blessing, right? That's no different than telling people, pray this magic prayer, yeah. and your God's going to do whatever you want because you're the one defining the territory. Uh. And that should make you go, eh. But here's the where it gets even weirder. We can look at that as a Christian and go, well, that doesn't seem right. But Christians buy into this all the time when we yeah. say things like the manifesting. Yeah. Um, or and, and we have to be careful in charismatic circles. I love my charismatic brothers and sisters. I'm gonna prophesy this into existence. I'm gonna oh, speak. Sure. I'm gonna speak. I'm gonna speak that my my debt be paid off. I'm gonna speak it. Yeah. Well, okay. What where? Tell me anywhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to proclaim. And expect that God is going to do it simply because I proclaim it. Yeah. I I have found in my asking God for things, one, I try not to do it all the time, but I certainly do, right? I'm asking more so for his like hand over the situation or like his peace and presence or like his love or his strength. Like I'm not asking can my debt be paid off? Does is that a same kind of prayer? Am I because 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 I would expect that God would at least meet me in that way. Yeah, well, and I think it's even okay to ask God. God, I really could use a miracle right now. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with asking. Right. Jesus tells us we can ask. Yeah, so we should ask. Right. The problem comes is a if you do this, God has to respond. Oh sure, yeah. That's where the danger lies. So oh, yeah. I actually think there's something powerful in praying and, and with truly the vision for the Lord saying, God, okay, let's say you're in massive debt. Oh, God, I need a miracle. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I, I, need, I need you to provide. Now, here's yeah. how God might provide. He might send you somebody who's a financial planner. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. What we think is he's going to magically put a check for whatever our debt is. Yeah, and it's going to the penny. Yep, and and sometimes I've seen God <laughs> yeah, do that yeah. in miraculous things where someone needed. It's not that He can't. It's that saying we have some sort of cheat code to make Him. That's right. Yeah, and and all okay. I'll use my own. Okay, so I've struggled with weight for years. Sure. It didn't until my twenties, which is, I used to play basketball eight hours a day, and if I wasn't playing basketball, I was playing volleyball. Right, and sure. then I started working full time. Well, you can't play basketball and volleyball eight hours a day when you're working. Right, and I got fat real fast. Right. <laughs> Because I still ate, like I played basketball and volleyball eight hours a day. Now I promise this isn't meant to be uncomfortable, but it's getting somewhere. Imagine for a moment, I'm forty pounds overweight. God, heal my visceral fat. Yeah, we've actually said this before. We've talked about it. Yeah, right? but it still applies. Yeah, could God do it? Yeah. Why would God do it? Uh, well, He measured your heart and said that it's something that would help I've you. I've never met anybody. Who's had fat removed? You're right, just like that. Just like that, right? Instead, what I could pray is God, Holy Spirit, help me shift my mentality and my heart, yeah. so that I'm not craving food yeah, instead maybe, of yeah, you. Yeah, maybe help me get rid of this. Uh, the, yeah, this idolatry to food. Yeah. yeah, and confession of my idolatry yeah, to food. Exactly. Or um, so then, what do you what do you have to say about like I've been told expect a miracle when you pray expect it expect a miracle. Yep. Like, what's the difference there? Because, well, because, because, and we've used we've used the same. I think there's nothing wrong with expectation. The problem was as, uh, and this is such a good question, Jaden. 
our first expectation should be for God's presence and for God. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to expect a miracle in the sense of, no, I believe it really can happen, right? Faith is important and part of the miraculous. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I think our language betrays us Mm -hmm. or sets us up for failure because when we tell people, all right, expect a miracle and then it doesn't happen, I only have two things to blame in that situation. Mm -hmm. Either God couldn't heal me or God didn't want to heal me, or actually three things, or I wasn't worthy of being healed. Either because I didn't have enough faith. Yeah, or like, or my expectations were too high, so then like you're saying, like, God couldn't meet my expectations. Or, well, I prayed the wrong prayer, right? Right. And and so I think the the heart behind that word, and maybe there's four, whatever, I, I need to stop saying, there's three things. <laughs> there are three things. There might be ten things, I don't know. Yeah. I just say it because it gets my mind going. Yeah, maybe, right? yeah, I got you. I think we say it because... If I come into prayer and I'm double-minded, according to James, mm-hmm. I'm praying for a miracle, but I don't actually believe miracles can happen. Now, God could still do it because he's God. Yep. Um, faith isn't what heals me. Right. God is who heals me. Yeah. But faith is one of the things that God looks at when he heals. Yeah. I, I'm going to butcher how I phrase this, but faith is it's a participatory it's yeah. There, yeah. There's, there's things that you do too. There's a handshake in faith. There's a handshake in faith, right? Yeah. yeah. And and I think that the problem becomes when you say expect a miracle. Some people put their faith in faith. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Right. I've got. I've. I put my faith in faith, and if I have enough faith, then I'll get what I want. Mm-hmm. No, you put your faith in God, and therefore, if you don't get it, if I expect a miracle, I should expect a miracle. God can do it. But then, if He doesn't, because my faith is not in faith and my faith is also not in the miracle, my faith is in God. And if it doesn't happen, then I say, okay, God, I'm trusting that there's a reason why you didn't heal or why you haven't healed yet. Um, there's a great book and I highly recommend it. Um, it's by a guy named John Burke. He, he is a retired pastor from Texas and it's called Imagine the God of Heaven. And it's all about near death experiences and people who uh, he looks at over 2000 NDEs. Mm. And one of the things that he highlights in there is that's interesting is every single one of them, well, the reason why they call their near-death experiences is that they died and then came back to life. Not a resurrection, not a Lazarus four days later, but sometimes minutes, 60 minutes, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But there's one thing they all had in common. They came back. Yeah. And he says, and I, I wish I had the book with me, he actually says, don't assume that because they died and then came back that their life was easy. In fact, he shares one story of a guy who was burned over like 80% of his body. Uh And he was given the choice. And the Lord said, you can come home or something like that. And the guy's like, no, I want to go back. He went back. He's now in ministry. He now care. Actually, he's a doctor. Sorry, he's a doctor. But think about, he was burned over a large amount of his body. How much pain did he have? He could have gone to heaven. Yeah. And rejected the pain and be fully in the presence of God, came back, and he still has joy, even through the pain. Do you get what I'm saying? So he he has a near-death experience after being burned. Mm-hmm. And he could have he could have avoided all the pain of having the dead skin removed. Right. Of yeah. all the plastic surgery, yeah, all the grafts. Yeah. He could have opted out and because it would have been worth it. Yeah. But instead he comes back and now he's a he's a surgeon who helps people in their pain. Now, here's the thing. Some people assume, well, God should heal me. God didn't heal this guy of his burns. He showed him a glimpse of heaven, and now all of a sudden his burns are worth it. Yeah. Right? Think about how that changes our perspective. Yeah. I think sometimes we assume that if God doesn't heal me here, there's no redemption to my pain. And God took this guy's pain. Man, this is where I wish I had the book in front of me. God took this guy's pain as a burn victim and all the things. And now he's redeemed that pain on earth. But now he's also, because he's a Christian, he's going to get to heaven and God's going to say, well done, my good and faithful son. But in a biblical perspective, that's prospering, but not from a worldly perspective, not from a prosperity gospel perspective. And because of that, he's increasing the territory of Jesus because now he gets to give others a glimpse of heaven. Yes. That's and, the blessing. Yes. And so it means that you have to change your perspective yeah. on blessing. What does it mean to have your territory enlarged? Okay, as a church, we believe that God has called us, yes, to Clear Lake and North Iowa, but also to the nations. Yep. And so we do work in Peru. We work with Genesis in Peru. It's not our church. We just partner with them. We have missionaries that we support there. Uh, we work with Venture Expeditions in Thailand. 
because this is how God is enlarging our territory so that we can be hope and influence other nations for the gospel. And now we're partnering with Compassion International. Mm-hmm. We're taking over uh, a church was had uh, was going to sponsor this village, and they couldn't meet the obligation. And so Compassion reached out to us and said, hey, we have 220 um, children that are in the same village, and we need somebody to do it. Do you think your church could do that? That's enlarging our territory. Yeah. That's us actually going, oh, by sponsoring that child, we are in, influencing someone born in the valley. Mm-hmm. And if I, now, let's think about that. Now, Jane, and all of a sudden, if you're actually praying, God, enlarge my territory, and God sees your heart, that your heart is for his kingdom, and that you can handle it, he probably will enlarge your territory. Because he knows your heart, he knows the vision that you have. But if you're just saying, God, enlarge my territory, but you don't have a kingdom for him, he's not obligated to respond. Or his, the way he enlarges your territory may not be through a better business. It might be through you witness to somebody who becomes a Christian. And uh, I think of the Billy Graham, right? Billy Graham touched millions, maybe over a billion lives. What about the person who led Billy Graham to Christ? Mm-hmm. That person has an indirect enlarged territory because God used their influence to reach Billy Graham, who ended up reaching the world. This uh a little off track, so forgive me. Everything's been off track. It's for, fine. Forgive me. Uh, but this very much reminds me. So the starting place for that sort of thing is your heart posture, right? Yes. The starting place, right? Recently I've been reading through um through Exodus uh with Moses and it talks about how uh God's like, Hey, take your sandals off. This is holy ground. Holy right? ground, yeah. This is holy ground, right? This is God's territory. This spot right here, holy ground, right? And a kind of revelation came to my mind where I was like, I actually want God's holy ground to be in my heart too. Yeah. Like I want his territory to be in there, mm-hmm. right? I want I want that to be holy ground. And so that's what this is all saying is that needs to be holy ground first or it needs to be influenced with that before your before your territory can increase, God better have territory here. And, and the real definition of prosperity is then you are prospering as a person. And, and... Not that it's not that he couldn't use your expanded territory, but we as individuals have to be okay with that right there being enough, right? The, him having territory. Well, when rest. Jesus is enough, you, you're not concerned about, about your territory. The rest. Yeah, see, that's what see, I'm saying. Jabez was concerned about enlarging his territory. Yeah. When God gets a hold of your heart, you're you're worried about enlarging his territory. His territory, yes. Yeah, it's not about mine anymore. Yeah, exactly. And and this is that's uh, why that language was kind of weird for me. I was like, I don't pray for my territory very often, though. Well, yeah, it's a it's a weird it's a weird language. To this was with. also Old Testament, so it is Old Testament. And I'm also reading the New King James Version because my Bible. You know, what's the funniest thing is that I have I have uh, my Bible. I have a couple different Bibles, but when I when I started reading a Bible that's like kind of become near to me and that mm-hmm. I've worked in. Yep. You were to say, "Hey, where's the Gospel of Matthew?" And I'm like. I don't know. It's a new Bible, man. It's a new. I don't know. Uh, it's New Testament, I think, Somewhere. right? Somewhere. <laughs> um, and it's all of a sudden. It's like my brain goes, "Where? Where is that?" You know, um, I, I always think that the the New Testament is so much bigger than it is because sometimes I split my Bible right in half and I think, "Boom, I'm going to be in the New Testament." And all of a sudden, I'm in Psalms. Well, it's yeah, it's 27 chapters. No, I know, but I just, I. I but know. that's why. I mean, you have yeah. It's 27 it's like, 20 no, books, half not the chapters. Book is the Old Testament and half the books in the New Testament. Duh. No. And and <laughs> yes. And you're right, and that's part of our misunderstanding. Is totally off of it, but totally off. Hey, man, this was an awesome conversation. I'm excited to, since obviously we're recording this pre Sunday, I'm excited to hear uh, how people take the prayer of Jabez. Man, this is going to be interesting. Well, and I'm more excited because I'm praying that we actually can sponsor 220 kids. That would be beautiful, man. That would be, and I. And we're gonna. We they heard a testament, a testimony, right? They're having a testimony. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think this is how we how you. And we as a church, but also you, this is how God increases your influence. You have the opportunity to influence, to bless somebody else, to enlarge their territory, yeah, their life, yeah. and be a blessing. Uh, well, for the life of me, I cannot find it. And I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm like, I know the verse, and my brain is just completely shutting down the text. Uh, and you know what will happen as soon as we're done? I'm like, I found it! I um, found it. There it is. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to give up. Oh, this is good. Um Hey, a couple fun updates. So they'll be listening to this the week of Easter, right? Correct. Holy Week one. So we have Jason Gray, who's yep. going to be part of our worship for Easter at yep. the Surf, which I'm super excited about doing a pre-concert, having him as part of the worship time as well. Um, but here's what, as you're coming in, if you're watching this before Easter, 
uh, we had just over 1,400 people come on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. And it's not about numbers. What I want to see is people who don't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to see, and I want to see lost and broken and hurt and people who are exploring or have walked away or uh, are are not active in a church right now. So that's what we can be praying for. And it's part of the reason why Lent, I love I love Holy Week because it is a it's a real preparation so that Easter is a celebration. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and so um excited for church at the surf, excited for how God's gonna move. Yeah. Dude, always a good conversation, brother. Yeah. Peace. Uh, uh, wait, oh we gotta keep reminding them all the time every week. I want us to say send us your questions to the email. All nine of you. No, we've gotten a lot more. In fact, actually, a lot of people were wishing you well when you were sick. Told you that. Oh, good. Anyway. So they're like 12? <sighs> Always send in your questions to <laughs> podcast at zionclearlake.org. <laughs> so there's all 12 of you listening. <laughs> no, I know that there are more, and we love that you're doing it. Uh, I don't, I mean, I just think it's, I think it's amazing that people watch us at all, man. <laughs> I do, too. I mean... And and the cool part is it's not even people who go to our church and no. something and it's non Christians. We have yeah. people who are exploring faith. Yeah, man. That watch this. That's uh, pretty amazing. So, all right. all right, I gotta get going because guess what? Our compassion stuff is over at the dock right now. Wow, get out Megan, of here. Megan needs help lifting stuff. Okay, bye.